a number of years ago, uh, Chad Burt said, hey, I think it would be good if we put our sermons on YouTube. Frankly, I thought it was a stupid idea um, because I thought, who in the world's going to want to watch us in La Harpe, Illinois? But since that time, it's been an amazing thing to watch what God is doing. Uh, there's over, I don't know, 1,200 subscribers to our Union Church channel. Doesn't that just sound weird, a Union Church YouTube channel? And I looked the other day, and there's 30-plus uh, sermons that have been viewed over 1,000 times. And the one that's been viewed the most has been viewed at this point 19,000 times. Way to go, Chad. Um, you just never know what God's going to do. People have a chance to comment on these sermons, and so I always read the comments, and Rick does too, and some are quite amusing. There are comments that people are trying to divert other people to other websites probably that are teaching better things, and we just delete those so that nobody knows about those. <laughs> and then if you subtract those people who think we're working for Satan, um, what's left are some really kind comments but the thing that you notice as you're reading this is that there's a lot of people who are very confused about the gospel. They're not really sure what it is. And so we're going to look at that today, even though I hope that you know what the gospel is. After this, you will know what the gospel is, I hope. But before we get to that, I want to jump to verse 10 of chapter 42 and listen to what we're told. This is, we see this command over and over in the Bible. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing his praises from the ends of the earth. Sing all who sail the seas, all you who live in distant coastlands. The, the main thing here is sing a new song to the Lord. That doesn't mean that we should just be singing contemporary songs in worship. And there are some people who seem to think that. We should only sing new songs. That's ridiculous. What it really means is sing a fresh song to the Lord. Come to me with a freshness when you worship me. So that could be, it's really about the harmony or the melody of our life, that the melody of our life should be a fresh sense of worship to the Lord. And one of the best ways of getting that fresh sense of worship and fresh sense of walking with God is to rehearse what the gospel is, because we need to remember what the gospel is. So in verse 18 through 20, this is the first thing, that we are by nature rebels against God. Listen, you who are deaf, look and see, you blind. Who is as blind as my own people, my servant? Who is as deaf as my messenger? Who is as blind as my chosen people, the servant of the Lord? You see and recognize what is right, but refuse to act on it. You hear with your ears, but you really don't listen. Last week, Rick talked about the fact that the Messiah is coming. That's at the beginning of chapter 42. And then it seems like he follows that up with this section where he tells us why the Messiah needs to come, what the need is for a Messiah and for a Savior. And what we need to remember about God is that God doesn't tolerate those who are not holy because it's against his character. God is pure, God is holy, God deserves the very best. And those who rebel against him are those that are facing the wrath of God. And that may seem harsh, but it's not. It's just consistent with God's nature. And what he's saying here is that you guys are doing all kinds of things. You're, you're going to worship, you're, you're doing religious stuff, but you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You're not honoring me at all by the things that you're doing. And as we've been going through Isaiah, of course, we've seen this indictment again and again and again and again to the point of almost tedium. But here's the thing, that if we look at Israel and we say, you know, we know that these guys just didn't get it. They, boy, how obstinate can these people be? As soon as we say that, we are indicting ourselves because we're just like Israel. We continue to uh, go our own way. Listen to what the New Testament says in Romans chapter 1, verse 22, 23. Yes, they knew God, meaning the people, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. 
They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be, a, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Now, think about what Paul just said here, and then think about what you may have heard on the news this morning. Is this not describing our own time? Is this not describing the condition of humanity even today? Over in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Now he's writing to Christians here. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. So this is the first tenet of any time you're going to look at the gospel. It's that we need to be made right with God because our default position is to rebel against God. Our default position is to say, I want to be God. I don't want to submit to a God. And so we are at odds with the Father, and something needs to be done. Down in verses 23 through 25 um, of chapter uh, 42 here, we read, those who hear these lessons from the past and see the ruin that awaits you in the future, who allowed Israel to be robbed and hurt? It was the Lord against whom we sinned, for the people would not walk in his path, nor would they obey his law. Therefore, he poured out his fury on them and destroyed them in battle. They were enveloped in flames, but they still refused to understand. They were consumed by fire, but they did not learn their lesson. In other words, all the bad things that have happened to Israel are really the result of their bad, sinful choices of rebellion against God. And this is a warning to us that if we do this, if we continue to, to make choices that are against God, we're going to face those same kinds of consequences as a nation and as individuals. Anyone who thinks that they are good enough to get into heaven is mistaken. Either they do not understand the nature of sin and how offensive it is to God, or they don't understand the nature of God and how holy and pure He is. Either they don't think that they have committed any sins, or they don't feel that they should be judged for the sins that they have committed because, well, after all, everybody's doing it. And isn't that the point of what he's just saying here? Everybody's doing it, and that's why God is angry with the world. But not so angry that God doesn't do something. In chapter 43, we read just an incredible passage. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. That's great stuff. I mean, it's an amazing passage there that he's telling us about being redeemed. That word um, redeemed is an interesting one. Some versions of the Bible say ransomed, but what redeemed really means is to buy something back. Uh, it's used of uh, Egypt. When the Israelites were in Egypt and God brought them out of Egypt, it is said that God redeemed his people by bringing them back to himself out of Egypt and slavery. When they were exiled to Babylon, when God brought them back, he says they were redeemed. The book of Ruth is all about redemption. It's a story um, about a woman 
Naomi, who had these two boys, and they both married women, and one of them was Ruth. And because of a famine that was going on in the, the nation, Naomi and her husband and their boys left Israel and, to save their lives. While they were gone, the husband died and both boys died. One of the daughters-in-law decided that she would go back home and try to start over. The other one, Ruth, said, I'm staying with you, Naomi. And so they come back to Israel, poor, dejected, feeling that life has been unfair to them, maybe. And then there's this guy by the name of Boaz that shows up. See, because uh, Naomi and Ruth left, their land was taken over. Now, in Israel, the land was given to a family for life. It was considered to be given to them by God. But you could lose the land because of taxes or because you were poor. You could sell the land. But you could always buy it back. And so they had this uh, principle that was called the kinsman redeemer. So a close relative could, on behalf of somebody, buy their land back for them. And that's who Boaz was. He was a guy who stood up and he said, I will be your kinsman redeemer. The story is much richer than that, but uh, I will be your kinsman redeemer. And so he buys back the land for Naomi and then he agrees to marry Ruth and to provide a child that will now be considered Naomi's so that she could have a family that could continue to hold the farm and the land that was given to them. And those of us who, are, who live in an area where there's a lot of family farms, we may understand how valuable that was. And the real point of the book of Ruth is that this child that was born was the great, great, maybe just the great grandfather of David. And so that's what makes the story so interesting. I don't know whether you remember that. I don't know if you had these here. Um, this is really going to date me. When I was growing up, my parents used to collect S&H green stamps. Did, did, okay, they were around here? Okay, good. We didn't know that was just a Chicago thing or what. And so every time you would buy something, you would get these stamps, and you would get these books, and you'd lick those things and put them in a book. And I remember watching my mom. This, uh, she was really excited. We're getting so many books. And really, that was the, the beginning of cash back on purchases, getting rewards. But that was much more primitive. And so you would get enough of these books, and you would take them to a redemption center where you could, in a sense, liberate a toaster or, <laughs> or a coffee pot or something. You could trade those stamps in and come away with something tangible. And what the Bible is telling us is that's what God has done for us. God has redeemed us. What was the payment? Galatians 1.4 says Christ gave his life to redeem us from sin. And because of that, he tells us that now we are part of his family. Now we are children of the king. And even though there's all kinds of barriers still, there's so many nicks that, that we need to have in our life to knock off the rough edges, we are his. And he has said that he will not desert us. Verses 10 and 11 of chapter 43 in Isaiah here says, but you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been. There never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. I like that. There's a couple things that you need to see from that text. The first is that fact that, um, that we are chosen by God, which is a a staggering idea because we live in this world where, where basically we're anonymous. Have you noticed that? You, you walk down a street of a busy city, nobody notices you unless you're dressed really stupid. Um, people aren't going to notice you. And so you, you, you can be in a big crowd of people and nobody even knows you're there. And we feel that sometimes even in a church even walking down the streets of a small town, don't you? You feel completely invisible. 
And yet the creator of the universe knows us and sees us and has chosen us to be his own. Why are we here today? We're here today because God has done something in our heart that changed our perspective on life. And instead of pursuing our own will, all of a sudden, now we, we desire what God has for us. What brings that about? He does. So the first thing he says is we are chosen. The second thing he says is I am the only Savior. Now I know that that's politically incorrect today. It is very unwoke to say that Jesus is the only way of salvation. But Jesus is the only way of salvation. There is no other way to get to heaven. You can't get there by a sterling church attendance. You can't get there by taking communion so many times. You can't get there by your baptism. You can't get there by the people that you witness to. You can't get there by any of that stuff. The only way to get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. And we keep wanting to say, but what do I need to do? He has done it. We're not saved because of what we've done. We're saved because of what God has done on our behalf. And that's a staggering thing to try to grasp. Well, it gets even more staggering. Verses um, 12 and 13, listen to what he says. First, I predicted your rescue. Then I saved you and proclaimed it to the world. No foreign God has ever done this. You are witnesses that I am the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I have done. In this world where we feel so insecure, you only have to watch the news to start feeling that anxiety uh, build inside of you. God is saying, look, If you are mine, nobody can ever take you away from me. And it's not just here in Isaiah. Jesus said it over in uh, a number of passages in the Gospel of John. He says, no one can snatch you from my hand. So relax. You know, our, our salvation is not about what we do. It is about his promise to us. He's made this covenant. He's made this promise that if you will come to me, I will make you new, and no one will ever take you from me. Even though at times we may try to wiggle free, I suppose. And then verse 25 of chapter 43. What great verses these are. I, yes, I alone, will blot out your sins for my own sake, and will never think of them again. Are you like me, that there's a lot of things you look back on your life with regret on? I say there's things I wish I had never done. There's people that I've hurt, and there's decisions that I made that I know were not honoring to God. And there's this part of me that says, I don't want anybody to know, because they would think less of me. And I don't want God to know. (laughs) How foolish is that? He already knows. But listen to what he says. I've blotted those things out. And he doesn't say, I've forgotten them. He says, I will remember them no more. See, that's the problem that we have sometimes with forgiveness. We say, I can forgive, but I can't forget. God doesn't forget what we've done. He just chooses to never remember it. It's a non-issue. It's dealt with. It's paid for by Jesus. And that's what we do when we forgive another person. We say, I know what you did. I'll never forget what you did. But you know what? It's the past. We're going to move on from here. I am no longer going to hold this as a barrier to our relationship. Wow. He has blotted out our sin. And that means that there is no more reason to regret to carry around that, uh, that, that heavy burden of regret in our life. Let it go. Christ has paid for it. We don't deserve it. We know, and we say, I can't forgive myself. And I had a professor once who said this to me, and I said that. I said, I, I know I'm forgiven. I just can't forgive myself. And he said to me, who do you think you are? 
well, I thought you knew my name. <laughs> and he said, if the creator of the universe has forgiven you, who do you think you are to say you're not forgiven? Wow. It was life transforming to all of a sudden realize that I am really forgiven. And you know what the good news is? You are too. You are too. That's the message of the gospel. All right, now, we need to respond to this, and that's the third thing that we need to understand because we say, okay, I know that I'm a sinful person. I get that. I see that Jesus paid the price for us, that God is the one who initiates this relationship, and and my sin's forgiven, but, but how do I get this? What do I need to do? Grace is not earned, and I said that, and no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. You may be sitting here today saying, well, yeah, yeah, I suppose there's a limit to the number of sins you can commit, and if you've gone over that, you can't be forgiven. No, there is no limit, because the sacrifice of Jesus was sufficient, sufficient for any sin, and it is efficient for those who come to him. And that's the message that we're given. And because of this, there is no room for boasting. What do we have to boast about other than the greatness of our God? We don't walk around and say, you know, I, I'm a believer because I'm smarter than you are. Have you met those people? You have my permission to punch them in the nose. <laughs> Seriously, I said, stop it. Who do you, you don't understand the gospel at all. And that's the thing that gets me irritated sometimes when I read some of these posts on our YouTube page. You people think you've got this all figured out. It's a, it's a wonderful mystery, a majestic truth that we should just receive and give thanks to God for this. We have not earned it. There's no sense for us to be pious and look down at other people and say, well, you know, if you could be more like me, you too could be saved. I don't want to be more like you. And that's why people aren't getting saved. There is no room for boasting, and we're told that God has given us the Holy Spirit as a deposit, which, do you remember what the next word is? A deposit which guarantees our inheritance. What a great word. When I, when I feel like, oh my, I've really done it now, I realize that God has given me the Holy Spirit, and that's why I'm feeling guilty. He's given me the Holy Spirit as a deposit which guarantees my inheritance. And even when I wander off, the Holy Spirit's going to draw me back, just as he does for some of you. So we have the Holy Spirit now guiding our lives. And what we need to do is we need to admit our sinfulness. Every recovery program that you could be involved in, the first step's always the same. You must acknowledge that you are a person who cannot save yourself. I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, I am a sexaholic, I'm a, purchase, a buying person, you know, I can't stop spending money. Whatever the case may be, you go to a recovery group, and the first thing is admit that you've got a problem. Same thing here. God just wants us to come and acknowledge that we need him. Lord, we need you because we are really messed up, and we're lost, and, and I've done so many bad things. And I could never, ever pay for this. Second, we need to confess and acknowledge that Jesus was sufficient. To say, Lord, I know, I really believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for me. And that when he rose from the dead, it proved that it was all true. That I can be saved. And I'm going to take you at your word. And I'm going to follow you. And that's really the third thing. So we need to admit, we need to declare, and then we need to welcome Christ into our life and say, Lord, I, I want to follow you now. And some people say, well, you don't have to have that step. No, God does not save us so that we can continue to live a sinful life and just feel good about it. That's not, that's not what salvation is about. He saves us so that we can find the life that we were created to live. And that is the life that is in obedience to his word. He does not save us just so that we could be miserable. He saves us so that we can find life. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be hard times. There will be. And sometimes it's even harder as a believer 
Because in this world in which we live, if you stand for the things that God says is true, you're going to be called names. And people are going to vilify you. But the truth is the truth. And it's only the truth that can set people free. And so we must stand. And we must do so in a loving way. At the very beginning, in uh, verse 10, we talked about singing a fresh song to the Lord. And it's a command to, um, to live out our salvation in a fresh and wonderful way. And I want to give you four suggestions on how to live a more fresh and vibrant Christian faith. How do we keep it fresh? How do we keep from taking this for granted? Number one, share the message with other people. There is nothing that will renew your enthusiasm for faith than to see God change a life in front of you. We are not told to go witness. Verse 12 tells us we are witnesses. It's who we are by our nature. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are witnesses. So the question is, how good of a witness are you? And what are you testifying to by the way that you live your life? Are you testifying to Christ? Or are you pushing people in another direction? But if you continue to share the message of Jesus, and, and this may be just a word, just a statement. It doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out thing. Just keep pointing people to Jesus, and what you're going to see is the excitement that comes into a life that, of a person who learns that they have been forgiven, and that energizes us, and sometimes will make you weep because it will remind you of what God has done for you. Second, venture out of your comfort zone. Dare to step out in faith. Try a new ministry. Dare to break out from what is comfortable and dare to do what you think God's calling you to do. Because when you do that, when you step out in faith and say, I don't know if I can do this, and you step out and you see that God is faithful and that God is using you, that energizes your faith. And that's fresh once again, and you come to the Lord and say, oh, God, why? Why would you save me like this? How could you be so wonderful to me? Third, revitalize your prayer life. Talk to God about the changes he's making in your life. Thank him for his promises. Seek his direction. Learn to love prayer. Seek to develop a faith that's honest, open, genuine. If you're one of those that feels like you have to get into some frame of mind, that, oh, God, you know, I thank you that I am, you know, thou art the earth. Okay, just talk to him. Just be honest with him. Have a conversation with the Almighty. You'll find that it brings a freshness into your soul. And finally, spend much time pondering your salvation. Remind yourselves of the truths that you find in Isaiah 42 and 43 and throughout the Bible. Remember often where you were before he found you. Marvel at the, the staggering words that he chose you. Allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the grace that sent Christ to die in your place. Let yourself be stunned anew by the reality that you are a child of God. If you remember the true message of the gospel, you're going to have no trouble singing a new and fresh song to the Lord, whether it's a great old hymn, a brand new chorus, or simply an enthusiasm for living every day to his glory. Let's pray together. Father, it's our prayer that you would help us to get the gospel right, that we could get off that treadmill that's based on our performance and instead embrace the grace that comes from Jesus. Lord, we can't understand it all. We don't understand how in the world the God of the universe could even see, much less know and love someone like us. And yet, when Jesus came, he said, that's why he came. So, Lord, soften us. Deliver us from the arrogance that so often is seen in church people. Grant that we might be soft. But grant also that we might be bold in telling others about the good news of the gospel. Help us in this church to be faithful. 
to preach the gospel no matter what. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song that we haven't sung a lot. And so if you don't really know it, you might pull out your hymn book. It's called uh, There is a Redeemer. Real simple, beautiful chorus. I'm going to stand and sing it with me. There is... When uh, Debbie and I were married, having both come out of uh, broken relationships... We decided we wanted to do something different at our wedding, something we had never seen before. And, and so in addition to signing the license, we had copies of our vows made. And after we signed the license, we went over and we each signed our vows. And they are now displayed on my bedroom wall. And every anniversary, I go over to the bedroom wall and I repeat my vow to my wife. And I do that because we need to remind ourselves of how we got to where we are. And as guys, we need to remind ourselves of what we, we promised to our wives. And basically, this is what we do in communion. We come back and we remember how we got here. We remember that we are saved not because of our goodness, but because of his incredible grace. We were reminded of the wonderful promises that he made to us in that upper room. And Jesus does something wonderful by giving us communion. He, he meshes words, promises, with actions so that it, it really rivets inside of us. And by the very fact of taking the little piece of bread and drinking the little cup, we are able to, in a sense, experience in a whole new way what he was saying to us. And you remember what he said. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. This cup is the new relationship with God that is established through the shedding of my blood. Boy, it's good to remember that. Some people say, well, well, how come you only do it once a month? It's preference. I'm just going to explain that to you. So you're already in the Q&A. Um, our feeling is, as a church, that we have no problems with people who take communion every week or take it every quarter. It doesn't matter. Um, we are all fellow believers, and I don't think the Bible tells us how often we need to take communion. But we don't want to do it every week because we don't want it to become mechanical. We don't want us to, to look for ways to do it as fast as possible. We want to take our time, and we'd rather do it once a month and take our time then take it for granted. And so that's why we do what we do. You can agree or disagree, that's okay. Uh, we may change sometime in the future, but this is where we are right now. So, as you hold the cup, as you hold the cups, because there's two cups, and if you haven't been here before, you know that there's the breads in the lower cups, so you have to kind of take them apart. And then just hold them, and we're going to take communion together, it's showing the fact that we are all in that same position. We are all one in Christ because we're all saved the same way.
it seems strange to say, but this is why we are believers. This is the gospel. Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. We say, how could one man die for all these people? It's because of who that one man was. That as the son of God, his life had infinite value. It could pay for all the people of creation and all the people of creation 10 times over and more because of the value of that life. What Jesus said to us is that you mattered to me. You matter. That's why I came. I gave my life to build a bridge between you and God because there's a great chasm because of your sin. I came to pay for your sin. So it's really not about what we've done. It's about who we are in Christ. So take, eat, be grateful. Later in the meal, Jesus took the cup. And I imagine at this time, these guys are really confused. They're freaked out. What's this body being broken thing? And they said this cup represents the new covenant, new contract, the new relationship established between you and God through the shedding of my blood. A new relationship. No longer enemies. But now we're family? That's a huge jump, isn't it? We are his family. And because of that, we have nothing to worry about in the world. The worst thing the world can do is kill us. When, because of Jesus, we get to go to heaven. And so this cup represents a drastic change in our relationship, a change in our orientation, a way of thinking that is entirely the opposite of the world. It's not about our performance. It's about his grace. So drink all of it and be grateful. Will you pray with me? Our Father, if we had the vocabulary of the smartest person in the world, there would not even be close to words enough to say thank you. So Lord, just we say very simply, thank you for changing our lives. Thank you for changing our eternity, our outlook, even our view of ourselves. Thank you for loving us, apparently since before the creation of the world. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude today by singing, then does free will really exist? Now, that is a deep question. I'm grateful that I only have two minutes. <laughs> um, but let me, let me just clarify something here. We, we run scared with the word predestination. Um, it's a word that's in the Bible. You find it in Romans 8. You find it in Ephesians 1. And therefore, we have to believe in predestination. It's how you define it that matters, and that's what people disagree on, and we may not agree on it ever. And I am in a process of moving through that continuum of what does it really mean? But here's the thing that we need to keep in mind, that the word is predestination, and it's talking about the fact that God has, before the creation of the world, I guess, decided who's going to be saved and who's not. Now, how he does that, that's the debate. But he decides who's going to be saved. Now, that's different than, um, than this idea that God has laid out every single thing that we're going to do. 
Um, that's determinism. So it, there's a difference between predestination and predeterminism. So God says, I'm going to get you to here. Now, how you choose to get there is kind of up to you. As Staples would say, you could do it the easy way or you could do it the hard way. And during the course of those choices, God will sometimes intervene to move us in a different direction. But for the most part, God wants us to learn by doing. And so there is a great deal of freedom. Here's a way to think about it. Um, suppose you were playing chess against a chess master. I don't know why I would be doing that, but suppose I was. And in that game, the chess master just moves his pieces. The thing is, he already knows he's going to win because he's way better than me. And he probably has a pretty good idea of how he's going to win. But I'm still in control of where I'm going to move my pieces. And he's going to respond to me. I, is, am I, do I lose my free will in that? Nope. I just am a lousy chess player. That's all it is. And so he will eventually win, whether he wins in five moves, if he's being generous, or whether he toys with me for a while. It's up to him. And it's kind of the same way with God. God doesn't toy with us, but God allows us to make decisions. That's why we see Israel getting punished. But God all along had said, Israel, you're my own, and I'm going to lead you to, to magnify me in the world. And that's what he did. And that's what he's doing. And that's what he'll do through us. But as far as the decisions along the way, those are up to you. And listen to the Holy Spirit, and you'll make the good decisions. And you'll, you'll get to where he wants you to be either way. One way will be pleasant. The other may not. That's all the time we have. If you have more questions about predestination, you're going to have to write it down on a card. And there's another question down here, so I'm not going to get to that now because it's 9 o'clock, and I promise to get you out. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for uh, whatever this predestination stuff means. It is staggering to us that you have been working in our lives and through our lives all this time. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to relax, to remember who we are, to hold our heads high, not because we're proud, but because we're yours. Amen. Have a great week. Take that for next week.